Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. <laughs> We're having a wonderful time here. Let me just, uh, can we get a jib shot here, Charlie? I don't want to put you on the spot, but what we have here, these are young people from our community. Some go to Lee University. Some go to the schools here in town. Some are just uh, young people. Got a few adults here mixed in the group from the area. And this is a lot of our extreme ministry, a lot of the, and, and also prayer ministry and mentoring for ministry, young people. And it's just, give yourself a hand just for being here. Yeah, go ahead. It's all right. It's okay. Give yourself a hand. I, I, I thank them for joining me today. We're enjoying ourselves. All right. Years ago, there was a bear that had been in a circus from the time it was a small cub. And they'd put it in a, in a cage on wheels and it traveled with the circus. And the bear would go like eight paces forward and eight paces back, eight, eight paces, eight paces, just all of its life. Uh, the story was told how that the, the bear, that someone had thrown a, a glass with a hamburger meat and it, it, the bear had eaten some of it and it hurt it and people were mistreating it. So finally somebody said, I want to buy the bear and I want to release it to a zoo in Germany. They bought the bear. They ch uh, shipped the bear in the cage, and they took the cage with the bear in it, the cage it's always, always been in, and they released it at the zoo. The zoo had this beautiful grounds, lots of natural waterfalls, trees. This bear was going to have a great time. When they opened the cage, the bear went eight paces forward, stopped at the opening, and went eight paces back. Finally, they had to take a stick and prod it in, on the backside, and it ran down a ramp, and when it got out on the ramp, it was totally disoriented. And... Everybody said, oh, thankfully, it's free now. It's going to have a good time. It went eight steps forward and eight steps back. And all that bear did was just keep walking because watch this. The cage was no longer metal. It was mental. And so my, I'm going to share something with you today in the spiritual battles that men and women are going through and in the battles that you're dealing with with your family and even some of you pastors. I'm going to deal with four keys that will set you free. Let's go to the book of Acts together, chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 5 through 11. And there are nuggets in this story that happened to the Apostle Peter that are going to give you the keys of being set free in every area of your life. Acts chapter 12, 5 through 11. Now Peter, therefore, uh, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guard before the door that were, door were keeping the prison, the guards. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and the chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals, and he did so. And, and he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him, and did not know what was done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And then when Peter came to himself, that means he realized he wasn't dreaming, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod, and from all of the expectations of the Jewish people. Now, this persecution, there were four Herods mentioned in the Bible. The first one begins with killing the infants of Bethlehem. Then the second one beheaded John the Baptist. And the third one is here in this story. He's killed James, one of the men of the early church, and now he's arrested Peter. And at Passover, after Passover ends, he's going to have Peter executed. And all of a sudden we read, now I want you to think about this, Peter is sound asleep to the point that when the angel comes in, he smites him on the side. He hits him to wake him up. Can let, let's do a survey. Everybody ready? If you knew you were going to be beheaded tomorrow, how many of you could have a good night's sleep? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand. Me too. I'll just keep my hands down. How come Peter's sleeping? Well, I'm going to go see Jesus tomorrow. Oh, hallelujah. I'm, no, no, no. Peter knew he wasn't going to die. I'm going to prove to you he knew he wasn't going to die. Ready? The reason Peter knew he was not going to die is Jesus, in the last chapter of John, 
made a prediction about Peter and said, when you are old, men are going to lead you, help, have to help lead you around. The Son of God already said to Peter, you are going to live to be an old man. And what happened is he wasn't old yet. He was still able to get around on his own. And Peter, when he finally died, was crucified upside down according to Fox's Book of Martyrs. Now, here's my point. The reason he's sleeping is it's like he's saying, I don't know how God's going to get me out of this mess, but I know before they put my head on that chopping block, God's going to do something. Are you with me? So let's look at something here about the keys that are going to set you free. Key number one is this. Fight your battles with the knowledge of God's will and you will always win. Peter had a prophecy. You're going to live to be old. In Acts 12, he was not yet old. He knew that they could not kill him until his time came. Jesus, many times, it says they tried to push him off a cliff, but his hour had not yet come. They tried to stone him in Jerusalem, but his hour had not yet come. There's three times in John's gospel where it says his hour had not yet come. Now watch what happens. When his hour comes, guess what happens? He gets arrested, he gets beaten, and he goes to the cross. Why? Because his hour came. Jesus knew nobody can mess with me till my hours come. I remember my dad used to really worry a lot about me flying and going. And, and he was a great man of faith. But he said, no, son, I stayed up and prayed and did this. And, and I look, I'm very grateful that, for, that he did. But my sister's in the audience and she, she knows he would worry sometimes when we just felt like he shouldn't. I finally said to him one time, I said, Dad, let me tell you where my faith level is. My faith level is that I'm not leaving till God's through. I said, honestly, in my heart. And so after I tell my dad this, we're in an airplane. It was a 421. I'm coming back from Madisonville, Kentucky. I happen to sit, the pilot's on the left side. I'm on the right side in the front, sitting at the front seat uh, where the pilot is. And uh, we're talking 13,000 feet in the air, 20 minutes from the Chattanooga airport. And all of a sudden, we hear this. And I went, uh-oh, that didn't sound right. And then he said, what was that? I said, I don't know. And then it sounded like, like there was something going on like a car with the water in the engine. And the next thing I know, the piston meter on the right side of that 421 went down. And I looked and I said, what's this mean? He said, we just lost an engine. Now, when a pilot says you've lost an engine, I'm thinking, uh-oh, where'd it go? You know, that it fell off the plane. <laughs> a ter the term losing an engine just simply means the engine quit functioning. So he checked the other one. So here's what I'm thinking. If that one went out and we don't know why it went out and it wasn't a fuel problem, how do I know the other one's not going to go out and it's nighttime up here? So here's what I had to do. I had to sit there and say, God, am I going to die tonight? Because my first, I'll be honest with you, my first impression was this is the end of it. But here's the point. I was building this building and wasn't finished with it. The Lord told me to build this studio. So I'm up there in that plane saying, now, nah, can't go now, can't go now. Lord, you know why I can't go? Because I have not finished my studio yet. And you would never tell me to go build a studio if you're going to let me die. And I had to take that word and fight by my faith. And my pilot was able to land that 421 with one engine at the Chattanooga airport. And we got out safely. And found out later that two people were up praying for us at that time because the Lord told them to. So I'm sure that's part of it. But here's my point. You have to fight your battles knowing the will of God. You have to say to yourself, what is God's will for my life? Let's say if God, if God tells you you're going to go here, here, here in your lifetime and you know God told you that and, the de and then the doctor comes and says to you, I hate to tell you you've got cancer. You just have to say, well, it's a good opportunity for God to heal me, ain't it, doc? Because God's not finished with me yet. And you're not being cocky. You're not being cocky. You're not being arrogant. You're not being proud by saying that. But you're fighting with what you feel on the inside of you because hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the soul sick. And what does that mean? It means, like, it means that like when you get a bad report, if you don't have hope that you're going to recover or hope that God's going to touch you, it'll make your soul sick. And then you, your faith becomes affected. So here's point number one. God sets you free when you begin to fight with God's will. When my, one of my men I mentored under was a great man of God by the name of M.H. Kennedy, Marion Kennedy. And he was originally from Mississippi. In fact, his family was real good friends with the, with the Elvis Presley family. And he knew Elvis and his brother personally. But listen carefully. When I came up under him, he told me a story. He said, Perry, when I was a teenage boy, I had a terrible sickness that came on me that brought me near the point of death. 
and said, my mother was a praying woman, and she would pray for me, and said, one day the doctor came over to examine me, and they said, Miss Kennedy, we're going to have to take him in the hospital. There's nothing we can do, but we can't promise you anything. We don't know if the, your boy's going to live or not. And he said, about that time, Perry, God spoke to me and said, Marion, I've called you to preach. And he said, I called Mama. I said, Mama, come here, I've got to tell you something. So his, the mother walked in, and he said, Mama, I heard God's voice. He just called me to preach. And the mama walked back in and said, you can, go, you can leave now, doctor. He said, what do you mean I can leave? You better get some help for your son. No, no, he doesn't need it. He's going to be okay. And the doctor started fussing with her and said, Doctor, you don't understand. My boy just heard from God. God just called him to preach, and he can't die because dead men can't preach. Hey. <laughs> hey, isn't that good? Dead men can't preach. So what did she do? She, by the way, he lived to be in his 80s, okay? So obviously he heard from God. But the point is, one way to be free is to fight with the will of God. How do you know it? The Bible gives you the promises that are a part of His will, and then you get it by revelation of the Holy Spirit in prayer. Number two, everybody listen to this, because a lot of these young people you're looking at here are on a prayer team on Thursday nights where we have great prayer meetings. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 22, seven things every believer should do. Now, if you're going to write these down, I'm going to talk too fast for you to write. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophecy, prove all things, hold what is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. This is what I call the seven secrets of success in a Christian life. If you do these seven things, you're going to, be, you're going to succeed in what you do for God. The one I want to key up on is pray without ceasing. Now the question is, how does a person pray without ceasing? Does that mean to just, oh Father, I want to thank you. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Oh, I want to, oh, take the garbage out. Oh Lord, I want to, does that, is that what it means? No, it means to continually have your mind and heart toward God. You have to work an eight hour a day job and your boss doesn't want you going in there. I'm talking about a secular job and you trying to work and decide you want to just stop in the middle and have a one hour intercession service because it just doesn't work that way in the secular world. But what you can do is when you're getting ready in the morning, you pray. Driving to work, you pray. Driving home from work, you pray. During your lunch break, you take a walk for 15 minutes and you pray and you keep your mind in an attitude of prayer. Now there are times, notice what the Bible says in the book of Acts in, the, in Peter's situation. He went to prison. They knew he was going to die. They knew he was under a death sentence, and it says the church ceased not to pray. So in other words, the moment they heard that negative report and the possibility of Peter's death in 24 hours, or actually probably within 12 hours, when they heard that, what did they do? They went into a time of really heavy, deep intercession, and they didn't quit till they got a breakthrough. So the second key of, of being set free is to understand that there are times that deep, deep intercession will bring you the breakthrough that you need. Jesus said to his disciples one time, he said, could you not tarry for one hour? And he was in the garden and just interceding until the sweat became as drops of blood. So, I, you know, some preachers, and this, this is being taught today, you should never have to pray more than five minutes a day, no more than 10 minutes a day. Let me tell you something, when you're battling demonic powers, when you have people that are under bondages, Jesus taught intercessory prayer. In fact, Jesus, the Bible said, would go rise a great while before day, before the sun ever come up, and would spend time praying in the mountains in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know he prayed three times, at least an hour each. That's three hours of prayer. And there are times that you have to pray without ceasing, meaning you have to get alone with God, and you've got to spend time in deep, deep intercession, interceding just you and the Lord by yourself. And I'm going to tell you something. There are some things that only break by prayer and fasting, okay? So there's going to be some times that you've prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing's happened, but it's going to take prayer and fasting combined. I call that God's power team to be able to accomplish it. So the, 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 the second key is to do what? To at times pray without ceasing. This is all in Acts chapter 12. We read it earlier. Number three. Oh, I got something for you here. Ready? Now, number three is you're going to have to break the soul ties with people who are keeping you bound. Woohoo! Can I get an amen? amen? You're going to have to break soul ties with people who are keeping you bound. Now here's the example again from the book of Acts. Peter, the man of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, is in a, number one, he's in a prison house. Number two, he's in chains, chains in both hands. And number three, he's chained between guards. So you got a prison house, chains, and guards. Notice what happens. Why does, why does the enemy want to chain your hands together? Because that's the work that you do. You work with the works of your hands. Psalms 1834 says, teach my hands to war. 
when I clap my hands, when I raise my hands, when I lay hands on the sick, that's using my hands for spiritual warfare, okay? So what the enemy does is he tries to stop your praise. He tries to stop your ministry by binding you. So he bound, he bound the man of God's hands, okay? The second thing he did is, uh, according to the Bible, is he's, he's chained between two guards. Now, the guards are controlling him. You understand when you're chained to somebody and you say, I'm going this way, they can say no and they pull you back. So, folks, you can be tied up and chained to the wrong kind of people. And they're manipulating you and they're controlling you. This happens to people that get in alternative lifestyles where sometimes people want to break out and they want to be free from it, but that person is a soul tie that's so deep that they have them chained into their mind. And so you're trying to pull away, and that person the, whole, the, the entire time is trying to pull you back in. Now, please be aware of this because let me go back and show you something here. So here's what happens. When the Lord showed up through the intercessory prayer and when the Lord showed up with the angel of God, number one, the chains came off his hands. The second thing that happened, watch this, is he put his sandals on. They had taken his sandals. Do you know what that means? They were controlling his walk. You know, you have to walk with God the way Enoch did. You have to walk by faith. You have to walk with him every day of your life, meaning moving in his will. Walking with God is simply doing his will. But here they got his sandals. The man of God can't even walk around because they got his sandals. God says, go get your sandals. Now that means your feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel according to the book of Ephesians 6 verse 15. The third thing, they controlled it. He didn't have a garment. And so the, the angel said, when the chains fell off, the angel said, get your sandals on and put your garment on because we're getting out of this prison house. And of course, in, uh, in Isaiah 61 and verse 3, it says God gives you a garment of praise in place of a spirit of heaviness. Now, Peter was released from those who had constrained him. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. Now, I'm going to give you the greatest nugget you've heard all night. Everybody ready? Get ready to write this down. Here it is. Ready? Deliverance takes it out. Deliverance takes it out. Discipline keeps it out. Oh, that's good stuff. I felt a quickening in my spirit for someone watching right now. Deliverance takes it out, but discipline keeps it out. Deliverance is when the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. Deliverance, in some people's cases, is the breaking of those ties of people who's leading them into a life of sin. Okay? Now, here's the catch. Not the catch, but the verse, I should say. John 8, 36. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. Watch this now. Deliverance takes it out. That's how you are freed. Discipline keeps it out. That's how you are free indeed. In other words, that's how you keep your freedom. I'll give you an example. Let's say that uh, let's just use pornography for an example, just as an example. But you've got some people that get real bound up in that kind of thing, okay? Well, if you know there's a place you go or something you do, then what you do to, to stay free is you prevent yourself from going there. It's just like people that have been alcoholics. We have a, uh, some people uh, that are in the town, that uh, Connie and David, that run a women's rehab ministry with about 15 women at the Women of Hope um, outside of Cleveland here. And when these women come in, let me tell you the, what the most amazing thing. Mark knows this because these women join us at our prayer meeting and they join us at the extreme because the extreme is just not for young people. It's for anybody that wants to come. And here's the greatest thing is to watch them mature in their walk with God. Coming in, you look at their eyes and their face. They're so bound up. They look like they've been beat up. They look like they've been abused. And you give them one month with God, and they're coming in there. Last night at the service, two of them were up there just shouting and dancing in the front and praising God. And I can remember when they came. In fact, one of the girls just got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she says, my parents don't even believe in this. Where I could, now they, she says, they love the Lord, but boy, they don't believe in this. And what in the world's going on? But you know what? If their mom, if her mom and dad love the Lord, they're going to say to her, honey, if that's what keeps you free, you keep on doing whatever you're doing to stay free. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, that's the third thing. It's breaking the soul ties that bind you up. Take, make the break. Now, here's the fourth one. Ready? Oh, get ready. I wish I had more time. The fourth key of being set free is to be delivered from the expectations of the people. Wow. Okay, I'm going to say something to some of you watching me here because I've already heard from a few of you. Ready? I'm known as the prophecy preacher. I got tagged that way because I started preaching prophecy and Hebraic roots a long, long time ago. 
I would meet other ministers, and they'd say, oh, here's Perry Stone. He's the prophecy guy. I, I'm the prophecy guy, okay? When God started transitioning me away from prophecy toward youth, I had partners that say, I don't know what he's doing. He needs to stick preaching prophecy. You know what? Let me talk to you in love. I'm delivered from the expectations of the people. When I first got called to preach, they said, your hair's got to be here. You have to wear a black suit, white shirt only with a red tie. Don't, no, don't wear a red tie because a red tie is a harlot's color. I couldn't figure out how those preachers knew what a harlot's color was. But anyway, that's what they told me. Don't, you'll get that later. <laughs> don't wear a red tie. Okay, so I've I'm, I'm, I'm got my hair cut right. I've got my right suit on. By expectations, when my mother was a, a young lady in the church, all the women wore their hair straight up. They all looked alike. And yet they all complained about having headaches. I said, Mama, bring your hair down so you won't have a headache. No, honey, I can't do that because somebody's going to say, can I tell you something? The reason a lot of sinners don't come to church is because they're afraid they're going to get prejudged. They're afraid people are going to look at what they're wearing and how what they're... Look, can I tell you about our ministry? I don't care what you look like. I don't care if you ain't got no hair, your hair's purple, red, or green. You know, someone told me the other day, I've noticed you got away from suit and ties, brother, and you need to go back to wearing suit and ties. I said, no, I'm going I'm I'm to dress the way Jesus did, robes and sandals. What do you think about that? I mean, that's a, see, when are we going to get to the point where we forget about the expectations of people? They expect you as a Baptist to worship a certain way. They expect you as a Pentecostal to worship. Who cares? Just worship. Just read the Word. Just go to church. Just love God. Love people. God doesn't want you to be bound by what people think. He wants you to please Him. And boy, I'm telling you, you'll get set free when you get delivered from the expectations of the people and you just become what God tells you to be. My time is up. Can you believe it? And I didn't even finish all my notes. Anyway, we're having a wonderful time here. Stay tuned. Please get this offer I'm offering because it deals with the armor of God in detail and warfare. God bless you. Be right back. Don't go anywhere. Christians are becoming needless casualties of mental and spiritual warfare, taking on battles with demonic influences that inflict hurts, wounds, and unforgiveness, which often cause family disasters. There is a proven solution, and you will discover your weapons of warfare in one of Perry Stone's most popular illustrated DVD series, The Armor of God. These four DVDs with six powerful illustrated sessions were preached live using the Roman armor. Perry examines the Ephesians revelation on the armor of the believer, including mastering the sword with a rhema word, how the anointing of the Spirit anoints your shield of faith before any conflict. The Spike Shoes teaching will explain how to stand in a face-to-face -face conflict. Learn about the pylum, a weapon most Christians aren't even aware of. Perry takes ancient military strategies and reveals the parallels for your own personal battle plan and explains the keys of moving from a weak soldier to a general in this end-time warfare. You will see in this illustrated series each piece of the Roman armor, including the standard that was used and how it can become a part of your battle code. These four DVDs with six sessions come in a beautiful album with a 50-page study guide of Perry's personal notes to assist in your study. This is part of gift offer AR32D. When you order the Armor of God series, Perry will also include an audio CD of his message, The Weapons Satan Fears the Most. If you operate in this one weapon that most believers seldom recognize, you will always be in God's will and overcome every form of opposition you face. Perry is offering this exciting series for your Jubilee gift of $50 or more for the Manifest Television Ministry. To order the Armor of God series along with the study guide and audio CD, The Weapon Satan Fears the Most, Call toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. You can also order online at perrystone.org or send your gift of $50 or more to Perry Stone, Post Office Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320. When ordering, request gift offer AR32D and include a gift of $50 or more. Shipping and handling are included. Your gift is vital to help keep the Manifest program on the air and reaching the world. The battle is on, and this series is designed to be your battle code for victory. 
We look forward to hearing from you soon. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me on the Manifest Telecast today. I do want to emphasize one more time the significance of the DVD series and the special audio uh, CD that's coming with the series this week that deals with the spiritual warfare conference that we had in Florida some time back. This was the best teaching that the Lord ever gave us on Ephesians chapter 6 plus just warfare in general. You know, there's a lot of teaching on it, but I never did hear coming up someone illustrate with the props about spiritual warfare. And that's what makes this teaching different. I'm not just teaching it, it's all illustrated messages. And it'll help you if you'll get that today. So you can order that at perrystone.org, 1888 bread or contact us. We've got to get this into your hand. And it's also, it's a very special rate that we're offering because we want more people to be able to get this at this particular time. Let me go through something quickly. Uh, I want you to join me. Let's go to some of the churches I'll be coming to. For example, in the month of uh, January, I'll be coming to the Park West Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, January the 22nd. That will be on a Sunday at 9, 11, and 6 p.m. Knoxville, Tennessee. We're coming to City Life Church. This will be our first Hebraic Prophetic Conference in 2012 in Tampa, Florida. Pastor Tony Stewart's church. Friday, two services on Saturday and two on Sunday. Uh, on January the 27th to the 29th. Then I'll be at the South Georgia Church of God Winter Camp Meeting at the campground in Tipton, Georgia. Thursday and Friday, February the 2nd to the 3rd. Unity Church of God with Pastor George Moxley, Jessup, Georgia. Saturday uh, a night through Sunday morning, February the 4th and 5th. That's in Jessup. Trinity Fellowship Church with Pastor Jimmy uh, Evans in Amarillo, Texas, which will be Saturday and Sunday, February the 11th and 12th. Uh, you can go to the website for the, the actual dates and times of these places and more information. And then the New Life of Christian Fellowship with Pastor Paul Zink, February the 17th through the 19th. And that will be in Jacksonville, Florida, another conference. Now, here in Cleveland, Tennessee, we're going to start conducting, I want to announce this to you, what's called the Reformation Reformation Weekends. Now, it will not be every weekend and it will not be every month. But in the month of February, at the very last part of February, which is the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, um, Eddie James and his team are going to be joining me, Mark Casto, here in Cleveland for another great Reformation Weekend. Now, you have to register. You, you, the youth pastors and youth groups have to register for this, and you can go to perrystone.org and get information on how to do this. There is no fee to attend, but we have to register to make sure we can accommodate the people. These Reformation Weekends are going to be fabulous. And then in March, we've got Karen Wheaton and Chosen coming in here in Cleveland, Tennessee, again, and the, we're going to have it at the T.L. Lowry Global Foundation. So let me just announce to you, if you're a youth pastor and a youth leader, to be a part of this. Also, our Mentoring Institute for Ministry is coming up in April. We've had hundreds of people come to our Institute for, for Mentoring, and we're just really praying right now about what the Lord would have us to share with the mentees that are going to attend the 2012 Mentoring Institute here in Cleveland, Tennessee. Now, all of this information is available on the website because we believe that God has put in our heart and spirit not to help to help mentor this generation that we're in, preparing them for missions, for evangelism, for youth ministry, for singing ministry, for outreach, how to reach the lost, how to defend your faith. I'm really feeling a strong pull that we need to start having some teaching at the Mentoring Institute on how do we defend our faith against the assaults that are coming, not only in universities and colleges, but with a very liberal society in which we're living in. But anyway, just go to perrystone.org. That information will be there. We'd love to have you join us in some of these meetings. God bless you is my prayer.